Um, oh, sorry, it's being recorded. Yeah, I'm sorry, something just came up on my on my screen. Oh, there we go, it's back. Um, so yeah, as you can see, it ranges from a financial approach purely, um, where there's no consideration for any ESG factors, but the investor um, or the portfolio is purely focused on profit return, growth, income, whatever their mandate might be, and they don't really care how it's achieved. Um, and that goes all the way to what we call um, impact only, which to be honest, really sits under philanthropy, if you like, rather than investments. Um, so we don't do too much of that because we still do have um, investment targets for our clients. Um, and what I've actually found quite interesting since coming over to the charity side of thing is that a lot of charity clients already had what we call negative screening as part of their investment strategy, um, given their philosophy and, and, and charitable values. So for example, some religious charities didn't want any holdings or any association um, with anything to do with contraception or abortion. And although that's not directly related to ESG per se, um, in that example, the restriction is more of, a, of an ethical standpoint, if you like. Um, but even now, and that's transcending across to, to the private client world as well. So as you can see, um, the more progress up the spectrum, the more consideration for ESG is given. Um, so I'd say a lot of our clients probably sit somewhere between negative screening and sustainability for those who are uh, you know, mainly interested in having positive, positive impacts in the ESG side of things. So Ian, if I can just, cool, thanks. So um, yeah, I realized that I've just been using the phrase ESG and I've just assumed you guys know exactly what I mean. So I should apologize for that. But um, I, think, I think it's pretty well known that it's environmental, social and governance. Um, so yeah, when we have a look at those different areas, um, we, you know, we consider um, each factor, which may include um, but of course, it's not limited to, um, first of all, the environment, which is things like greenhouse gas, uh, deforestation, waste, and how that sort of thing is dealt with. Um, we've then got the social side of things. So quite a few clients um, are quite interested in diversity on boards, um, you know, modern slavery, child labor, all things that have gone on in Boohoo in the last 12 months have been really, really current. And then you've got the governance side of things, which is more to do with the actual management of the company, uh, remuneration, um, those sort of things. And they have quite a lot of interest. Um, we find quite a lot of young investors have quite a lot of interest in what's going on behind closed doors, um, having grown up sort of around the 08, 09 sort of catastrophe that happened then. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of clients will, will, will consider one more than the other, um, but that's the holistic approach that, that, that we take. Just next slide, Ian, if you don't mind. Yeah, great, thank you. So um, one of the programs that we use at Bruin, um, which Ian's gonna go into quite a bit more detail on, um, is called Sustainalytics. Um, and essentially what that is, is that it's a third party provider of ESG data and it provides data on material risks and opportunities which are fed into traditional financial analysis and models for our buy list stocks, which I just spoke about previously. So, for example, our SRI buy list. Um, so the investment management team also use sustainalytics and the research team analysis to consider the most appropriate companies for investment in the portfolio construction process. Um, so Sustainalytics really um, for, any, for any client that's looking to try and integrate ESG is a great starting point. Um, but I'm not gonna steal Ian Sunder um, as I realize he's got a couple of slides where he's gonna cover that off. So Ian, if I can just pass over to you. Thank you. Yeah. So there are, there's quite a wide range of funds or firms that will provide ESG screening or ESG ratings. Um, and I don't think any of them are perfect. It's quite a competitive market. It's a really burgeoning market. There's an awful lot of growth around it. I mean, it's the same business was recently bought by Morningstar. So there's a lot of money going into it. But for us, it's not the case that we're just going to rely on an external data provider. 
is actually just one input into our process. So even if Sys Analytics provide them with kind of maybe have a negative score on the stock, it may be the case that actually we will discount that because if we've got a slightly different view or again, the, the opposite. But actually when we went through a procurement exercise and we looked in detail at all of them, for us, they were, they were the outstanding kind of provider in the marketplace. So as I say, it's got the backing of Morningstar, it's got all of their resources, uh, operations across the globe, tons of people, blah, 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 blah. But I think the important thing was really this focus on materiality. What I mean is actually focusing on what's important. Um, so I know that some providers, providers certainly I've looked at, just have the same system of rating every company, irrespective of whatever industry it's in. And actually, when you look at the academic research and you look at kind of anecdotal evidence, ESG really matters and it really delivers better results when it's relevant to that kind of company. So, for example, if you're looking at the company's climate gas or greenhouse gas emissions or their climate change you know, positioning, that's absolutely something you want to be talking to Royal Dutch Shell about or BP or BHP Bulletin. But if actually if that determines whether or not you invest in Brew and Dolphin, for example, you're looking at the wrong thing because that's not going to impact about how successful or give you any kind of insight into our business. So it's the fact that Sustainalytics has this big focus on what is material for not only industries, but also going down to company level is kind of really, really important for us. And the way that they do things is to start looking at kind of what's the company's exposure to a material ESG issue uh, on a kind of a, a full holistic point of view. They then kind of drill down and say, actually, of that total exposure to ESG risk, how much of that could they manage if they really wanted to and how much is actually just outside of their control so the example there is the obvious one if you're an oil company you can't really help the fact that you are dealing in a fossil fuel something that is polluting when it gets burnt but then they drill down even further and say of the bit that you can manage actually how effective are companies boards of directors are the, the teams that are doing this at managing that risk and clearly some are far better than others some will have policies covering everything and they can demonstrate how those policies are deployed and how they are doing things. And others may only be skimming the surface. They might have a, a fairly loose policy that you can't really prove is implemented, but it's about managing that. And then from that, you can then see what is the risk? What's the bit that management aren't covering and what's the bit that they can't cover in its entirety? And you can come to a score that you can then compare with other industries and compare that across markets, across all different kinds of firms and geographies. So for us, Sustainalytics is really, really useful, but it's not the sole, it's not the be all and end all. We will take that as just one of the inputs along with everything else that we do when we are looking at you know, evaluating a particular investment. Laura, am I handing back to you here? I didn't think so. Sorry. I can. Okay. So this uh, slide may be slightly less relevant, um, but the way that we work is individually tailoring stuff for all of our individual clients. So the ESG part of our investment selection is pretty much for everyone. We can do it to a lesser or to a higher degree for those who are interested. But the way that we really tailor things is to be able to employ individual clients own ethical criteria. And for us in the charity world, that kind of really applies. So we find that a lot of our medical charities, so we deal with a lot of NHS hospitals, we deal with hospices, uh, we deal with kind of research into medical charities, etc. They will have very strong ethical focuses around what they do for a living. So clearly, we don't want a cancer charity to be investing in tobacco. That's an obvious no-no, and they'd lose supporters if anybody found out that they did. By the same token, environmental charities are much more focused on climate change, on biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. And that also applies to individual clients. So people such as yourselves, your parents, their grandparents, whoever it might be, they will have things that are really important to them. So we put an extra filter in that we can exclude whatever it might be, tobacco, alcohol, fossil fuels, gambling, pornography, et cetera, et cetera, before we kind of drill down. But that's maybe less relevant to, to what you're doing with the Alpha Fund. Am I carrying on now, Lauren? I thought you were, sorry. Um, no, that's okay. Yeah, sorry, that was my understanding, but happy to pick up if you um, a little bit later. No, uh, so for us, again, this may be less relevant for you if you're building a fund of kind of individual holdings. 
but we want to be able to employ our ESG techniques into the funds that we own, so collective funds, unit trusts, investment trusts, whatever it might be, because uh, it doesn't actually make sense to only do it for part of a client's portfolio. And the way that we go about doing that is that clearly not all funds will have the same level of ESG integration, or they won't all do it in a similar way. So there's a certain minimum standard that you have to achieve to get onto our buy list, irrespective of what you do. And that's really to have an understanding of ESG. I think if you go out to the world and you say, we believe ESG is important, you need to make sure that we're investing with alongside people who also share that view. So we make sure that everybody at least understands it, they consider some of the issues and that they vote their shares. Um, but we also have a much higher standard of, of proof. So our enhanced list, the SRI buy list, this is looking for the leaders in this area. So people who've really got an ESG culture embedded, this is their kind of leaders in the field, fully integrated. They do things on a, on a really enhanced level, uh, very strong transparency in reporting. And we also apply to them an exclusionary policy. So we make sure that these funds will promise not to invest in tobacco, alcohol, armaments, you know, thermal coal, uh, tar sands, et cetera, et cetera just so that we can ensure that if we do buy these for our ethical clients, that they are consistent with what they're trying to achieve. Another of the kind of key areas for us, and again, this may be less relevant for you guys, but it might be interesting to, to, to kind of know about, is the stewardship and engagement side. And this really comes back to when we're investing, we are medium to long-term investors. We're not in and out of a stock within a quarter or half a year, year. We're buying and we're buying for a reasonable period of time. And when we're holding stocks, we are custodians of our clients' money. We have a responsibility to make sure that actually we are looking after their money as best we can. We also recognise that we've got power. We've got power as shareholders uh, looking after our clients' money and that we can vote their shares at company AGMs. We can have that power if we wanted to, to you know, alongside other investors, force out of boards to force a change of direction. So we are very conscious of that power we want to make sure we use it for the good so we do make sure that we vote on all of our holdings and we publish our voting records so you can see and our clients can challenge us if they don't particularly agree with how we voted and we go above and beyond that so we know that actually with our power as a shareholder we can get in front of company management we can arrange a meeting with the ceo or whoever it might be and discuss with them uh, are they why are they not disclosing on a certain issue or are they doing something which we don't think is in the, the best long-term interest of the shareholders? And can we ask them to reconsider what they're doing? And clearly, if, if they do it, fantastic, brilliant. That's great for everybody. If they don't, we've then got other options. We can vote against the director's re-election if we really wanted to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we can, through a lot of this, like, force some change. And I think one of the good examples, particularly recently, is Compass Group. So Compass is a holding that we've got throughout Brindolf, and it's one of our, our reasonably large holdings. It's certainly not one of the largest, but they were, were one of their subsidiaries was providing school meals. And it was one of the, the company that was held up on Twitter for the, the really poor standard of food that they were delivering, uh, only going back a few weeks now. I think as soon as that, that story hit the news wires, our people were onto the company. We got straight through to the chief executive and we told them, and this is unacceptable, this is not what we as shareholders expect. And all credit to the firm, to be, to be absolutely honest, you know, they dropped the ball, it was a mistake that they'd made. But the chief executive took three or four days out of his diary to, to really focus on this and they turned it around. And I think for us, we can't honestly hold our hands up and go, well, hey, look, we sorted it, we didn't. Uh, I think that as shareholders, if we're all doing the same thing and forcing companies and telling them this is what we need and what we expect and what we want, they are more likely to make those kind of changes. And you could argue that Compass is a weak company for having made that mistake. But I would always take the other side of the argument that actually you don't really know the true strength of the firm until they've been through a crisis through a mistake. Um, so that's quite a good example of how we can use our engagement to actually deliver good things. But we're also very conscious that although we look after almost 50 billion, it's you know, a hunk of, hunk of change and I wouldn't mind having that in my bank account. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not massive. So we do join together, we collaborate with a lot of other investors to try and get our way. And some of the ways that we do that is through some of the things you see on the screen. So Climate Action 100 Plus, you might have heard of. This is an international group. I think together, if you add up all the assets that all of the supporters of this group have, 
you get to something like 250 trillion. It's big money. And everybody who signs up takes a commitment to try and push the big greenhouse gas emitters to make change and to make the necessary action. Uh, we signed up and we've picked up with Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's company, if you've heard of that. So we're pushing them to disclose more. Um, I mean, as an insurance firm, they don't have a huge exposure, but it's, they own an awful lot of subsidiaries. They own a lot of US railroads, for example. So we are pushing them to make changes in that respect. But it's only through the power of collaborating that we can make a difference. Because if we knocked on the door on our own, holding less than 1% of Berkshire Hathaway, they're not going to listen, they're not going to do anything. But if we knock on the door and say we're backed by £250 trillion pounds worth of investment, they might. So Climate Action 100 is a good example. The Investor Forum is a very much UK-focused example. And the Investor Forum is much broader in terms of its remit rather than just climate change. And then the one in the middle, BMO, is Bank of Montreal, or certainly their UK arm. And we've been employing them to do a lot of our engagement on our behalf, because we recognise this is a very specialist uh, sector. It's something very specialist to do, knowing how to get in front of company management and also knowing how to get them to take action. So BMO have got a team of almost 50 people who are really experienced in doing this. So we can employ them and gang up with them to, to try and force some action. Um, so I might just skip over that one because that's what's really bad to do. Um, so hopefully we can prove that we, we are quite active. A lot of the questions that we get, just moving on to this slide, is very much about, won't this mean worse investment performance? Um, and that's quite understandable because that has been the case, or certainly it's been the argument that some investment managers have put forward going back many years, that if you do invest ethically, you give up part of your returns. But I don't think that's the case anymore. And this slide hopefully proves it. So there's three lines on the chart here that you can see. So the dark blue line, the highest line, is effectively responsible investing. This is taking the MSCI World Index, uh, but tweaking it for their SRI version. So the SRI version excludes some of the worst fossil fuels. It excludes high interest rate lending, gambling, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see actually this has outperformed by quite a material margin, the standard MSCI index, which is the line below. So this is showing you that actually investing in a responsible manner, taking into account ESG factors, et cetera, et cetera, is additive to performance over the long run. And this is across the, the wider world. And I think I also talk to clients and I show them the MSCI, I've also got a version X fossil fuels, which again shows you the same thing. So I hope that we've got enough evidence to show that actually this is a good thing to be doing. We're not doing it because actually it makes us look nice. We're doing it because actually it can make us it will help us make some more money for our clients at the end of the day. Um, so I've nicked a few slides from other people that I've seen make quite good presentations that I thought I'd just include here as well. Because one of the, the big arguments is, you know, why bother? Uh, even if the performance is there, is that truly right? Um, so this slide from Hermes is quite interesting because they've done an awful lot of research and they can show that you know, good ESG standards will lower your cost of capital, you know, directly hitting the bottom line. Uh, it results in better operational performance and you'd hope that actually a company that is on board and looking after things properly does indicate that they are looking after other things properly as well and it does show that they get better stock market performance as well. I think one of the interesting questions is which ES or G, which one is most important and to a degree I might take this with a bit of a pinch of salt but certainly historically it shows us that this stat here shows that focusing on governance is does give you a, a more impactful result in terms of overall performance. Now, going forwards, I'm not sure if that will be the case. I almost think that governance has been such a key area of focus. It's kind of the easiest one to do because you can apply the same governance standards across different industries and across the world. It's more of a tick box exercise, so it's really easy to focus on governance. But maybe that is why we've had such a dispersion in, in that return, in those returns. Um, but actually, I think it, it is also perhaps illustrative of the companies that are really poor on the governance are perhaps more likely to make bad decisions and therefore have worse investment performance. But it is quite interesting that is, that is kind of the standout performer. So on that statistic alone, you know, the most important thing to focus on is the company's governance rather than their environmental or social factors. But as I say, that may change in future for me. The other quite interesting one is actually looking at this kind of slide, which is a little bit technical, but this is looking at how spreads in the kind of the debt markets 
applied for different ESG scores. And what we're really showing is that if a company or a bank, or whatever it is in this case, has very good ESG scores, i.e. towards the left of this graph, they've got much lower CDS spreads, i.e. the insurance cost against their debt defaulting, than if you've got very weak ESG scores. So just another kind of point of evidence that having good ESG scores, doing the right thing in the right way, is additive to company performance and to investment performance. The rating system I've kind of touched on, but it is quite interesting. It's worth just spending a moment just talking about it a little bit more. There's an awful lot of firms out there um, and they do differ quite wildly in terms of what they say about different firms. And the reasons are actually, when you think about it, reasonably obvious in that a lot of the information that they're rating is not mandatory. It's voluntary disclosures in, in many cases. Uh, companies will disclose different things at different times in, on different measurements. So to a degree, it's quite subjective. And particularly that materiality factor, if other firms are doing that the same as Sustainalytics are, deciding which area of ESG is most important will differ between them all. So that bit at the bottom, I think, is quite interesting that when you compare the same company through different ESG ratings providers, the correlation is reasonably low at only 0.61. And you compare that against what the correlation is for credit ratings, where, of course, they're basing their ratings on you know, published information, annual report and accounts, statutory information. Correlations for those credit ratings are 0.99, i.e. they're much more aligned. Um, so that, to a degree, is a bit of a risk. It also makes it quite different, quite difficult. Um, so in that slide just touches on some of the reasons as to why they differ. But to give you an example, I think this one is, is quite a nice example. So Tesla is a firm that everybody knows. Um, you would think that it's an electric car company, therefore it's great on its, uh, on its e scores, on its environmental impact. Um, but actually, uh, some ratings providers really differ in terms of what they do for Tesla. So it actually comes at a top score with the MSCI ESG scoring, purely because on those environmental factors. But when you look below the surface, their governance is awful. Now, Elon Musk pretty much runs it with, a, with his own free will. He tweets about stuff without telling the markets. Um, they don't have the proper controls, et cetera, et cetera. So the FTSE, in terms of their rankings, put it as one of the lowest. Clearly, it depends on is your focus on the environmental side or the governance side. In this case, really de determines a massive difference as to how you score your ESG ratings. The same list is got there somewhere in the middle uh, by way of interest, but it does mean that you do need to be really careful about which ESG rating provider you're looking at because they can differ quite a lot. And then this is almost my final slide, and I just thought I'd kind of finish on this. And for me, this is kind of the, the bigger picture stuff. So this uh, really feeds back to the, an example of Vodafone. So many years ago, Vodafone set up a subsidiary, you may have heard of it, it's called M-Pesa, and effectively it's mobile money. And really the impact that this has had, particularly in the third world, has been transformational. So I've put a picture of a goat herder on there. I don't know if he's got M-Pesa, I simply just Google goat herder, but essentially, if you put yourself in the picture of a, a goat herder in Africa going back before mobile money, you know, you dealt exclusively in cash. The bank was probably a day's walk away you had the risk of being robbed. You couldn't really take your goats to where it was best for them to feed because you always had to stay within a day's walk of, of the bank. You were really limited in what you could do. With M-Pesa, however, your mobile phone becomes your bank. You don't need a bank account. People can pay you straight to your phone. You can go wherever you want. There's less risk of being robbed. This has been really transformational in terms of worldwide development. I mean, it's been a great investment for Vodafone as well, don't get me wrong, but it's estimated that they've taken about 200 million people out of poverty through the benefits of M-Pesa. It's been great for gender parity as well because it allows the females to manage money, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, ESG didn't capture that. It doesn't capture that at all. ESG has much more focus on the picture on the right. So Vodafone had some pressure going back a few years about paying fair taxes. And that would have, at the time, I don't think ESG ratings were particularly big things back then, but would have led them to have quite a poor ESG score until such time as they actually declared their fair tax policy. Having a fair tax policy doesn't mean that they pay any more tax than they did before, but having disclosed a policy on it 
and being fair in terms of how you pay your tax would have boosted them up the ESG ratings. But I just kind of stop and I ask you, which has had the biggest impact both for investors, for shareholders, but also for the world? And my take is that the obvious one is M-Pesa is the biggest impact, but that's not captured in the ESG. That's not captured in any of the rating agencies. That's much more of a, an impact type investment. So for me, ESG, the difficulty with it is that it, it can become a bit of a box ticking exercise and it may be missing the key point about if we do want to be investing where we're making the most difference in the world, are we sure that ESG ratings are capturing all of that? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and then I'll just put in another slide in there just to kind of really highlight this is not the reason that we came on uh, this evening, uh, but we are currently recruiting for a, a graduate position to join our team uh, probably in the summer of this year. Uh, more details are on the website, but I won't dwell on that too much because this is not a, a recruitment call, but very happy to answer any questions on that that is of particular interest. Um, but that, if I haven't bored you all too much, is pretty much everything that we wanted to cover. So I will pause there and ask you if there's any questions. Well, I just want to say a huge thank you for the talk. Um, if anyone has got any questions, um, Definitely, you can either post them in the chat or turn off your microphone and say it. I'll give it 10 seconds if anyone has, and if not, and okay, here we go. Uh, what are the most significant challenges facing the wealth slash investment management industry? So that's a really interesting one. Um, for me, I'll let Lauren speak as well afterwards, but I think the, the investment industry or the wealth industry there's, there's challenges in regards to fintech and robo-advisors coming in. Uh, certainly there's a potential that, that they can make my role redundant. Um, I would argue that actually we live in a complex world. There's so much different things going on that you probably, I would argue at least, that you need a personal advisor to guide you. But I fully understand somebody who's got relatively simplistic needs, just want to invest some cash, just downloading an app and doing it on that. So there is the potential that we can be disintermediated by some of these new fintechs that are coming through. And I think the other big one for me, and I might be stealing Lauren's thunder, is that the investment industry has relatively poor diversity. So I've been to conferences before where it's literally back to back white males. You have hardly any females, you have hardly any other kind of ethnicities. And that is an issue. It's a massive issue in terms of are we getting the best talent into the industry? It's something that I've really kind of really focused on and want to open up the doors to everyone and get the best people we can in. It also means actually, are we appealing to all of our target audience? If you can't find an advisor who looks like you, are you more willing or less willing to, to invest with them? Um, so I think the industry needs to change massively from that perspective. I don't know, Lauren, if you've got anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, I'd probably build on the whole um, fintech thing. Um, just, just, just from being in sort of my mid twenties and, and and having a look at how apps are downloaded and, and and sort of grew up with apps and the iPhone and everything. Everyone's got online banking. I don't even carry a card anymore. I just I don't carry like a wallet or anything. I've literally got everything on my phone. I just like tap and it recognises my face and I can pay and you know and um, so I can definitely see that becoming more of an issue. But also on the side of just the next generation and I class myself as that and obviously the you guys on this call um just remaining relevant in terms of yes you know wealth is important and, and and having a lifestyle is important and all those things and but i think a lot of the younger generation also have a lot of care about some of the stuff we've just spoken about like esg focus and just trying to ensure that we're not just seen as people that want to make money or you know take home big bonuses or whatever you know that we are people who can have positive impacts on society and that's a fine line um, because yeah our job is to make sure our clients clients portfolio grows or it does whatever they want to do which nine times out of ten is is, is to grow obviously um, and to invest but to try and to try and fit that with having positive positive impacts on society and not being seen as some sort of banker capitalists like back in 08, 09. So I think that's a fine line that could be quite difficult to achieve. 
and of course the whole um, the whole diversity thing goes without saying. Brilliant. Uh, I think that's good. Okay, let's get another one in. Um, so Sid says, suppose I just started in the wealth management industry. How would uh, you be able to build your client network? So maybe Laura, that's a question more for you, given that I'm really old compared to you guys. So um, it's, you know, it's tough. Um, there's no doubt about it. I mean, as I say, I came from, I, when I joined Bruin, um, I started just as an administrator. I say just as an administrator and you know it you know it gave me such a good grounding and it's actually very complex and with the stuff that the administration side does and from that worked with a lot of the investment managers and then moved on to the private client desk as an investment management assistant and then as i said more recently moved over to the charity side of things so there's there's two ways I'd approach that. I think private clients, I can say this because there's no private client IMs on the call, so it's fine. Um, I think it is a little bit easier to get clients um, in the private client world, um, just, just because there are, by definition, more people than there are charities. Um, and um, there's always that networking ability um, and someone always knows someone or your friend knows someone or you get introduced in that way. Um, but really, um, I think just talking from a charity perspective, I've, I've had conversations with Ian about this and about how I'm gonna build up my client book. It's, I think it just starts from just getting in front of existing clients as soon as possible. Um, and that's what I start to do with Ian learning how to build that rapport. I mean, it's been quite interesting having since joined the charity team, I haven't actually seen a client face to face. So obviously that's been particularly difficult. Um, trying to introduce myself as a new member of the team, but also them only seeing this little square on their screen. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, I don't have a client yet, you know, and I've been at the company three years, but I also, don't have a client because I'm not yet qualified. And if, you know, qualification can take up to two to three years. So there's also that to consider as well. So alongside doing your qualifications, I would also really encourage you to um, join a uh, sort of local group. So there's one called Future Faces, which is sort of people my age up to about 30, 35. Um, there, I think Ian actually, were you, were you part of something similar like that back in the day? Not back in the Thank day, you, maybe, back in you the know, day. all those centuries ago. Um, yeah, there used to be something yeah. called Birmingham Future, which I think is actually just merged with Future Faces, but there were kind of lots of young professionals networks. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that I've tried to, to get involved in as much as possible. But of course, you know, the last year it's been really difficult. Um, but I think a lot of it, you know, you're not just going to be handed clients. And I don't think you would want to be handed clients I think you want to build up that own relationship like that's something that that's something that I most enjoy about the job um in terms of you know building that rapport so um I don't I don't know I don't really have like a b and c answers it's um because I'm still finding out myself to be perfectly honest but Ian having had more experience um just wonder how you built your client book up so it is about doing or trying to find out what works and it will be different for different people. So Lauren's mentioned networking. So there are tons of different networking events you could go to if you particularly wanted to. Pre-lockdown, you could have been out every single night of the week doing something, meeting people. And it's very much about the first time you meet someone, they're not going to go, oh, yeah, I've got half a million quid in the bank. Can you help me? It's about building that relationship, uh, meeting someone at a networking event, then you know, taking them back out for coffee. Um, trying to just build a conversation and working out actually how you can help them. Because often at times, if I've been out and helped somebody out by putting them in touch with someone else or giving them a little bit of advice on something else, they're more likely to remember you and they're more likely then to try and repay the favour. So networking is a great one. We also get a fair amount of our business through other professionals. So it's really important for us to stay in close contact with solicitors, with accountants, with a lot of other firms. Uh, other advisors actually give us tons of business too. Um, so that's really important and I think one of the other good ways that you can do particularly is kind of the at the outset is just to get your name out and about by writing articles uh, I know people who host podcasts who do all kinds of stuff just to really show actually I do know what I'm talking about and I can you know, put that across in a really easy to understand way 
Um, but yeah, one one particular route won't work for everybody. It depends on your firm, depends on your personality, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Brilliant. I think that was a very comprehensive answer, definitely. Um, okay, Josh uh, says something that I, I also want to uh, reiterate. Um, so a lot of companies kind of put out an illusion that they do all this amazing, amazing things. How do you separate the greenwashing from the companies who actually um, implement ESG? So I think that there's no real easy answer. And having said that, it may be the case that we are being hoodwinked by some of the companies that we invest in. But I think once you've got the depth of research that we've got uh, in terms of using sustainability, analytics, in terms of being able to sit down in front of company management, often it's the, the kind of the intangibles that you pick up on. So if I'm sat in front of a company director who's coming to see us or I'm listening into a web webinar, if ESG is the, one of the last things they mention, that's possibly a clue. You can then delve into it. And I've seen some really good analysts just kind of explode some myths just through some really pertinent questions. So if you think, actually, you're just saying this for show, there's no substance behind it. And at least we have the ability, uh, in many cases, to you know, interrogate company management. I say interrogate, you know, question and really get to the detail. And you might be able to say, you know, this presentation, Pat, you said X actually, can you talk me through a bit more about that? And we don't think that's that's quite the, the case here, or maybe there's an industry article that says something else. Um, we also, one of the things that Sustainalytics does do as well that I didn't touch on, is they monitor controversies, and that's also quite a good indicator. So if there is a scandal anywhere in the world, Sustainalytics will, will hopefully pick up on it. They take, I don't know, I think they say 60,000 media sources, they feed into their database, so anything that kind of happens, they will rank its, its severity and they will measure how many, how often these things come up. And that's quite a good indicator to me if somebody's saying that they're fantastic, they're doing everything on ESG, but actually a lot of the time there's media articles all over the place that they're not doing it quite the same, then you can use that as a good indicator. But I think you know, nothing is foolproof and there might be firms out there who talk a really good talk without actually doing walking the walk. I don't know, it's something that we, we still need to, to focus on and, and see what else we can do. Brilliant. I think you just answered the subsequent question about why you chose um, Sustainalytics. Um, so I, I think I think that was good as well. Uh, George just asked, what is ESG's outlook on nuclear energy? Uh, it would seem like there would be significant investment slash interest at first glance. Yeah, I mean, yeah. for me, ESG is very much an input into the process. And a lot of people who take an ESG approach will have a different view on that. It's not as though everybody would take the same view. And the real fundamental of ESG is that you take into account these factors alongside your, your traditional analysis. So the traditional stuff you do about pouring over the balance sheet, P&L accounts, you build your, your models as to how you think profits will move in the, foot, in the future. Um, and then you integrate into that all of your ESG factors It's an input. Um, and I think this is kind of really relevant because there was a lot of press stories at the time that the Boohoo crisis erupted about some ESG funds who were holding Boohoo. And they were, scan they were trying to scandalise the whole issue and say, this is ridiculous. How can a, an ESG fund hold Boohoo? And for me, actually, that's, that's probably pretty reasonable because when they say they're ESG, all they're saying is we've considered these factors. And it may be the case that actually they are weak on these other factors, but the investment opportunity in other areas is so big that actually it's still a buy. It's just one part of what you consider. Uh, and Boohoo, for their own practices, were okay with the factories that they owned. Actually, they had the right policies, etc. It's the other stuff that they were really, really weak on. So I'm not sure there's one simple answer to whether nuclear is ESG or whether you say nuclear is good or green. I think it'll be interesting how the EU taxonomy comes out on that. So the EU are trying to work out what you can call green and what you can't. Uh, and that'll be quite interesting because I think there's been some negotiations and it's getting a bit political as to whether nuclear is included in that or not. Um, but yeah, um, it's another one I don't think I've got a straight answer to, unfortunately. I just, I am muted. Okay, um, I've actually got a question. Um, so. I, I do a fair, about, a fair amount of investing myself. Uh, one of the firms which um, I kind of like at the moment is called Altria. 
which is a massive you know tobacco company american tobacco company um mainly because the dividend yield is so high uh do you think you know these you know companies which are being kind of blacklisted by a lot of you know charity firms that deal with tobacco or or arms do you think there's going to be a point in the future where firms kind of wake up and think if you've got a huge pension fund hang on a minute I do want an 8% dividend yield compared to a negative yielding bond um, in the bond market. Do you think that there could be a shift towards towards that again? Um, because you know, right from you know, 2012, it has a downward trend. But in the last kind of, I would say, six months, it's actually, if you look at the technicals, it's on an upward trend. Do you think the technicals are just technicals and the fundamentals are going to be that psychological stop um, to stop it from going back up? I think there will always be investors who will have different ethics or different kind of focuses to others and be, be willing to kind of invest in things like that. There'll be a buyer at the end of the day at some point. Um, so I don't think they'll, I mean, you could view a future where actually the public markets are closed to oil and gas, to tobacco, to alcohol, and they end up in a very small hands uh, of a very narrow group of investors. I'm not sure we'll get there. I think one of the risks really to the growth of ESG is the fact that we might see might be seeing bubble conditions in a few stocks in a few areas. And actually, when you see bubbles in some areas and really cheap valuations in the others, that is prime cause for, for a rotation back into those kind of stocks. And this was exactly so when I came into the industry, it was kind of 2000, 2001. And again, that time, tobacco stocks are on their knees. At that point in time, a lot of stuff was going through the courts. Everybody thought that they'd pay huge damages. People would stop smoking and that, you know, there's no reason to invest in the tobacco stock. But if you'd have got in to a lot of the firms in 2000, you'd have done really, really nicely indeed. So to a degree, I think that there is a risk in the near term that ESG stocks and or stocks that score well on ESG have been pushed so high in terms of valuation that they might be ripe for some kind of rotation into other stocks. Um, the other thing I look at, there is a, a, a fund over in the US, the Vice Fund, and it invests in everything that, that we'd be too, too scared to touch for our clients. So it's, it invests in guns, tobacco, alcohol, uh, gambling, et cetera. Actually, the performance isn't too bad over the long run, um, to some degree. And I think that, I mean, to a degree, that kind of undermines my argument that ESG is additive to performance. Uh, but I think at, at some point there will be investors for every kind of firm because everybody's different. That's, that's really interesting. I'm just actually just looking, looking at the price fund now. W why is there kind of a fund that that is basically um, immoral and uh, eliciting wicked wicked behaviour? Um, and why is it doing so well? Uh, I think everything in moderation, isn't it? everybody's entitled to go out for a little drink and have a little gamble every so often if you really want to. It's the, when things are taken to their extremes, they're really negative. Um, but to a degree, that's kind of another of these morality factors that you have to take into account. Is alcohol immoral? Mm. Uh, excessive drinking, you could argue, is immoral because of the impact it can have on people's health and on the health service, et cetera, et cetera, and the, the impact on crime. Um, but I mean, we've got, it's quite interesting. So. There's a client in particular, I'm thinking about a religious client. So we've sat in the meeting and the bishop has said, oh no, we can't invest in alcohol or tobacco. And then the meeting's finished and he said, oh, do you want to go outside for a fag with me? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and we've gone out for, for lunch afterwards and had a glass of wine over lunch. And it's that kind of thing where you know, in moderation, is it really wrong? Mm. Yeah. Definitely. And everybody's views will be different. It, there's, you know, there's no one set of morality. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, actually, that um, there could be a sort of transition back to, uh, yeah, to because at the end of the day, like, Ultria's whole business model is kind of transitioning towards, um, you know, e-cigarettes or more towards, they, they recently took a majority share in you know, Kronos, which is uh, uh, basically a uh, marijuana company, um, and they could be transitioning towards that, which could be, could be seen as more more friendly than, than tobacco which which i think is interesting but we'll just have to we'll have to see how it plays out see, see if the uh congress can pass more uh, legislation uh, legalizing it in america um but unless anyone's got any more questions i'm going to try and finish 
within the hour. Um, Amy, Amy just said, what is the ESG outlook on investing in companies that have poor ESG ratings in order to try to force change in the company? And that is quite an interesting area. I know there's a few funds that are really focused on, on that kind of area where there is a movement. There's probably poor ESG at, at the moment, but there is a new management coming in or there's been a, a damascene change and you can drive some conversion. Because actually, if there is a bit of an ESG premium in the market, the firms that are good on ESG uh, are getting higher valuations, then that's quite a good profit opportunity. But that does rely on your ability to either change management's view or to be able to spot where there's been a new board of directors that, that really gets it and takes this on board. And that's not particularly easy. But I think if you can do it, then there is a profit opportunity in there. I'm also not sure how ESG it is to force someone into ESG. Um, it's kind of a little bit ironic. Um, it, it, you know, it would almost be framed as greenwashing. Like, are you doing this because you're getting on the bandwagon and, and, and you know, you want more growth or are you doing it because you want to do it? And I think, you know, I think the latter plays into the whole argument of social responsible investment rather than being forced into it for, for financial gains. Brilliant. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,